Welcome to day two of the Udacity Festival and this global meetup for the School of Data. My name is Jane Shepard and I am the Director of Growth and Strategy for the Careers Team here at Udacity. Before we get started, let's find out who's here with us today. So please type in the chat where you're joining us from. I'm joining from um, the Bay Area. I'm originally from Chicago, but I came here for the weekend. Um, looks like Colorado, Iran, Houston, Tunisia, a couple California spots, Dallas, Germany, San Francisco, Sri Lanka, Virginia Beach, New York, Sydney, Wisconsin, Costa Rica, um, Charlotte, Bangladesh, South Africa, Indonesia, North Carolina, Washington DC, Virginia, Cape Town, India, Sweden, Nigeria, Zambia, Istanbul, Rio de Janeiro, Mooresville, North Carolina. Wow, thanks everyone for joining us for whatever time of day it is where you're joining us from, Pittsburgh, Detroit, Canada. Thank you all, um, and Agana as well. Uh, so thank you for joining us. We are so looking forward to today's session and we're really lucky to have with us today, Juno Lee. Juno is an instructor and a content developer in the School of Data, and she's going to explore how data science can be used to make the world better, data for good. So we encourage you during the session to share your questions in the chat. We have some experts, expert alumni standing by to answer any questions you might have. And then after Juno wraps up her presentation, if we have time, we'll do some Q&A. And after that, we'll break into smaller discussion groups where you'll have the opportunity to actually talk to each other and discuss what you've learned or share opportunities and all, all of your ideas about the School of Data and anything you've learned. So let's get started. Please welcome Juno Lee. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm super excited to be talking about Data for Good today. Um, that's one of the uh, a big motivation for me to join uh, just the tech industry. I feel like it's a very, very powerful and scalable tool that can be used for good. And I'm so, so excited that all of you guys are interested in this topic. So really quickly, I'll be first be going over the programs in the School of Data Science for those of you who don't know. Then I'll be going over a quick overview of what is data for good. Um, then different ways that data science can be applied for good and some project highlights. And then lastly, um, some organizations you can join or things to keep in mind if you want to get involved in the data for good movement and how it can help your career. So first, uh, the programs at the School of Data Science. There are two main tracks. Um, so if you are not interested in programming specifically, but you do really want to use uh, data science, then the track on the right is for you. It starts with the business analytics. Actually, if you go to the next slide, I'll show the prerequisites. Yeah, so no programming required for the right side. Um, uh, if you want to learn how to use like different platforms and like things like Tableau or super cool visualization tools um, and like Excel and statistics, you'll find really great resources here. On the left side is if you want to use programming. Um, R and Python are both super popular in data science. And our program specifically focuses on Python. So the first course, the first program is Programming for Data Science. And you'll get an overview of Python, SQL, and uh, the data anal analysis process. And that'll prepare you for the Data Analyst Nano Degree, where you'll learn more about statistics and the data analysis process. Um, and also super helpful tools for data visualization. And lastly is the Data Scientist Nano Degree program, which is divided into two terms. The first term is a um, overview of machine learning fundamentals, which is very technical and super important for data science. And in term two, um, where you see me, is where you'll learn additional skills that are super helpful for making a well-rounded data scientist. And this includes skills like software engineering practices for data scientists, um, data engineering skills, um, useful tools like machine learning pipelines, natural language processing, and a bunch of different case studies, uh, recommendation systems, stuff like that. And so those are the programs in the School of Data Science. And now I'll be talking about how data can be used for good. Um, so recently, data science has exploded. It's super popular. Um, we all know how data science can be super, super powerful compared to um, humans manually labeling data and trying to sift through data using Excel to find conclusions. And this is a funny quote that Jeff Hammer uh, said from formerly from Facebook, the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads, which is kind of funny and kind of sad, but although 
a lot of data scientists are being used for um, use cases like this. It does fuel a lot of innovation and growth in this technology. And we should really keep in mind how we can take advantage of this technology in order to benefit the world because data scientists make up a very, very small portion of like the human population. And with all these really powerful tools, we can really make a huge difference. So there's been a gap between all the technical expertise and resources that's been allocated to different data science problems. And to help mitigate this, uh, to help this gap, there's a lot of different amazing organizations that popped up to help connect um, expert data scientists and nonprofit organizations or government agencies to um, bring together volunteers who have the skills and the heart to um, work on these projects. And some of these include DataKind, um, Driven Data. Driven Data is actually kind of like Kaggle, except it's very specific for social impact projects. Um, Hack for Impact, which is a broader tech, um, like tech for good um, initiative. Data for Democracy, Bayes Impact, um, some specific competitions in Kaggle, and a fellowship at the University of Chicago, Data Science for Social Good. So let's talk about how data science can be used for social impact. Um, so as we know, compared to humans, computers have a very strong advantage because they can do calculations at a much larger scale and much more quickly than we can. And we want to make use of all of the, uh, all of the work that humans have put in the past, such as situations like these, where um, like experts in the field who have a lot of domain expertise labeled a lot of different scans to know which, um, like which scans show lung cancer and which scans don't. And situations like these can be super, super powerful if you apply data science. Um, this specific example is from Driven Data. And uh, they basically automated a lot of manual effort that humans put in the past and made sure that the lung cancer detection was actually a lot more, um, oh yeah. So cancer fighting engineers used thousands of examples from CT scans that were previously labeled by clinical teams and they programmatically flagged concerning nodules from early screens and they prioritized people who needed it most. And things like this can help streamline a lot of effort from humans. And the next example is this from DataKind. So another reason data science can be super helpful is to illuminate um, insights for planning and future designs. And in this case, they used it to really help um, tra uh, traffic ca crashes. And in these, so in this specific project, there were lots and lots of data with many, many different features. And there, there's a lot of potential relationships that are very difficult to identify by hand. And because there's things like weather data, location data, seasonality, humidity, um, traffic, all these other things, and whether like a street is one way or two way. And using data and machines to analyze all this data and come up with solutions can really make a huge difference. So in this map, you can see that there's, they had simulations for um, uh, crashes that can be really reduced with certain recommendations that they had. And in the next slide, um, this is another example uh, from the fellowship from the University of Chicago. And this was to help the illegal um, and overfishing problem that's hurting our oceans. And in the last five years, we've really advanced in tracking technologies, um, low satellite imaging costs and sensors. And with all of these tools, um, they partnered with the World Economic Forum's New Vision for Oceans Initiative, Spire, Digital Globe, and Planet Labs to identify um, using satellite imagery creating a fishing risk score. So this could ultimately help them detect like uh, places that are dangerous for fishing and um, guide governance, inform policy making and improve enforcement. And this example is actually one of the projects in term two of the data scientist nano degree. We partnered with figure eight, which is pro uh, provides a lot of amazing data sets and labels. And this is from a disaster response messaging data set. And we got this from a bunch of text messages, social media posts. Um, one big problem that disaster response um, teams have 
is filtering through all of these very, very important messages during a very short period of time. Because when a huge natural disaster occurs, you'll get an influx of information regarding like questions on where to find certain things, um, like notifying what areas need a lot of help, what kind of help they need. So it's very difficult for humans to manually prioritize these things and um, bring the right teams to the right places. So in this project, you actually use a multi-classification um, model to classify each model based on the category of uh, disaster response it has and whether it's related. Because sometimes these things can just be like article or news and that's not exactly what we want to send to the uh, disaster response teams. So lastly, um, is some tips on how to get involved. So there are a number of reasons that, a uh, number of ways you can get involved. There are competitions um, in sites like Kaggle and Driven Data, where you can just submit a bunch of projects like Kaggle, but for really, really good causes. And you can also volunteer for organizations like Datakind, where you can participate in 48-hour hackathons or do longer-term projects, sometimes a few months long. And I would really encourage people to, I mean, doing additional projects on the side is always super helpful um, because it gives you a new perspective when you work in different data science challenges and so many different uh, fields. And you get to meet a lot of different practitioners too. And it's really cool when you get an intersection of uh, highly skilled data scientists and tech professionals in general, and people who are very passionate about what they're working on. Because if you combine those two things, um, just very brilliant solutions can come up and you can do a, get a lot of learning when you're analyzing a problem with, I don't know, just a strong desire to actually come up with a solution. And it, comes, and it lets you be a lot more creative as well. And when you're applying for a career, of applying for different jobs in data science or trying to inspire other people to get into data science, just talking about your projects and seeing how passionate you are and different problems you explored is like super, super effective. And yeah, I would, I would encourage everyone to participate in one of these because it's very, very meaningful and all of you guys are super, super talented and skilled. So I think it would be amazing and you guys are already amazing for being part of this. So thank you. Thank you, Juno. That was an awesome trip through Hotties. It's really great to see you recommending people to take these skills and try to actually turn them into doing good in the world with them. So we had a few questions I'd like to jump in. Um, my first question is, do you have any tips for promoting data science and research on like social media or in Medium? And how can, how can people promote the things that they've done to share that story with the world? Oh, that's amazing. Do you mean, um, do you mean data science in general or data science well, regardless, I think I think, oh. I think specific, this question was specifically asking about how to promote the research they're doing or the projects they've done. But I think you can address um, the broader question as well. Right. Um, I think a very helpful way to share, especially on social media, is visuals. And I think I mentioned this uh, briefly in a previous webinar. But even if you have like a very, very incredible model, um, like, like that other slide I just showed you, we could have like a multi output classification model and, and if the accuracy is super high and I optimize it a lot with grid search and these pipelines and it sounds really cool. But when I try to show it in social media, especially for people who don't know data science that much, or even if they do, it's very difficult to promote it with just text and results. So I would highly recommend um, putting in extra effort to be uh, be comfortable with different a uh, data visualization tool or web development. I know both of them can be web development can be a little bit more of a stretch, but I think even if you have um, small visuals, especially if they're interactive, to show the result of what you did um, can be super impactful because when people um, look at your post for just like a few seconds, it's difficult to say like, oh, what did you accomplish? Why is that impressive? Like, how does this fit in? But it's very immediate to say like, oh, you built a tool that can show me this, or you built a tool that I can use to do this. And it doesn't always have to be interactive. It doesn't always have to be like you input something and output something. Um, like, you know, like that very powerful TED talk uh, from Gapminder, I think, that showed how like, the, like those animated like bubbles, Th that was super cool. Um, I could provide a link for that quick, but. That would be great, yeah. If you yeah, that, that resonated with a lot of people because when you hear facts, it doesn't mean much, but when you see a visual of things moving and 
Like it's very, I think in general, people are very visual creatures. So that can really help, I think. I think one of the challenges though, especially with social is um, compressing large data sets, right? So data right. typically is very, uh, it's a lot of data. By oh. nature. So compressing things to show the visual. So if you have any tips for that, I think that would be great if you could show, uh, share any of those. Um, oh, what was it? Compressing so, so, so distilling down, um, like you can, you can do a, a huge visualization that's going to be enormous, right? But on social, you'll probably want to do some sort of a subset or a snippet of that so that people can actually get the gist of what you're saying without right. having to try to transfer these giant data sets. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I just mean like a GIF <laughs> or a screenshot. Actually, I recommended this a lot also on Udacity projects. Um, one thing I like to see when students submit projects, uh, well, one, it's highly recommended you have a GitHub, like a README, but I get confused sometimes when you put all this work in to make a beautiful web app or beautiful project and you don't have screenshots. Even if it's just screenshots of things you put in your terminal or like some of your processes, just seeing visually what you've done helps me understand in the first few seconds what you accomplished. Um, another quick recommendation about promoting things, I would highly encourage you to join meetups. I think there's, I mean, there are definitely a lot out there who are seeking presenters. And if you created a project that you're really proud of and you have cool visuals, or even if it's just, I think it's like a five minute presentation or a 10 minute presentation, if you can put a quick slide deck together um, and have maybe a little demo, and you don't even need a demo, a video, um, presenting that at different meetups can be super effective and even recording videos um, of your presentation can be helpful or creating a YouTube video yourself and doing screencasts. Um, yeah, so visualizations with graphs or web apps um, and videos, I think, are, and presentations are super powerful. Awesome. Speaking of visualizations, we had someone ask, and a couple of people are weighing in, but we'd like to get your opinion on what are some of the best visualization tools available in the industry right now? Best visualization tools, I'm, I'm biased because I use Python a lot <laughs> and I know how powerful you can get, uh, how powerful, like how much you can do, especially if you get super detailed with Matplotlib. That's pretty much like the standard. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I haven't tried enough to say I know like the definitive best in the industry, but um, I personally really like Matplotlib and I think that the visualization and the, so the convenience of Matplotlib is super powerful to me. And I think the flexibility you have with what you can create with web development and D3 is super powerful, but those are just my biased opinions. <laughs> Someone online voted for Shiny as well. I don't know what your feeling is there, but um, good to hear. If everyone in the chat wants to keep weighing in with yours as well, thank you, Juno, for, for giving us a start there. Um, I wanna pivot a little bit to one of the things you talked about. You mentioned Kaggle, and um, I know that a lot of people, Kaggle is a great, um, a great a great platform for people to do projects right. and share projects and do competitions, but it can be a little bit scary and, and you're not really sure where to get started. So do you have any tips for someone who would like to get on Kaggle and like to jump in and what they need to do to prepare to be successful? Right. So the great thing about competitions like Kaggle is that there is a very low like entry point. So actually a lot of uh, a strategy I think a lot of people use is you come up with like a super, super baseline model. It could be like really bad, it doesn't matter. And you just submit that. And now you have a starting point. And now from there, you're just improving at any more things. You shouldn't be intimidated to submit something that's poor. Right? A lot of, there are a lot of poor submissions. Um, and that's a good thing. You learn from that and you can see what other people post. But yeah, definitely don't be scared. You, everyone posts like an initial like shitty model. That's no problem. Um, yeah, and also reading blog posts, there's a lot of, uh, articles online about people who discuss their uh, path um, towards making a really cool model for a competition. And it's really cool seeing their thought process, um, some of the problems they went through and how they overcame them. And they all start out with, I first submitted a very baseline bad model. And sometimes it's cool how you can, I mean, even if you do a very baseline model, you're probably not last. It's, there's a lot of people doing that. So please don't be scared. Everyone starts somewhere, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you also talked about data kind and driven data. And I'm curious to know if you think that there are some of the differences between them when people are trying to decide where they should get involved. Are they separated mainly by the types of projects that they get involved in or by the um, areas and what, what, what are the differences between and do you have any a roadmap for people who want to get started? Maybe what could help them select the pl best place to start? And that was that you said data kind and driven data? Mm -hmm. Or all, any so, of the other examples you gave? Yeah, so DataKind is 
so they're so driven data is more like a competition platform like Kaggle, um, where data kind is actually a place you can physically go to. Um, it's it's a huge organization and they have chapters around the country. And uh, yeah, it's they partner, so they have a lot of projects that you can you could either do hackathons and there's also um, partner, yeah, there are partnerships with companies. Um, so those are a bit longer term and Whereas uh, in competition styles, there's a bunch of people submitting to optimize like the best model for a specific problem, which is amazing. It does provide a lot of great information. Datakind is more about just connecting skilled volunteers with, um, with different projects that are uh, requested by like these like NGOs and nonprofit organizations and stuff. It may be best to get your feet wet in one of the other ones and just get a little bit used to before you jump into a full on project where you're assigned to something. Right, but even before you do a full-on project, um, the hackathon is a great way to start. Awesome. And um, I would really highly recommend, there's a lot of these organizations and a lot of them are amazing. And I don't know if I could, I can't do all of them justice because they are really amazing. Um, so I, I, even if it's just for a minute, I would suggest looking up the website and just really quickly reading um, their story and projects they work on in the past and how to get involved because there's a lot out there, definitely. Awesome. Speaking of visualization tools um, in projects, um, we had a couple of people asking about Tableau and other tools like that. How do you feel about, uh, I know you talked about Python, but maybe some of the um, platform tools that are geared toward helping to um, visualize data. So I'll be honest, uh, I'm not very familiar with non-programming data visualization tools. I know there are other people at Udacity who do, and our programs are built with them. Um, it's more on the yeah. business yeah. analyst space. Right, and depending on the company, they depending on how their data is stored and who they're like, who makes up their teams, they'll use different um, products. I do think there, I do think tools like that are super powerful because, um, again, like it's I don't know if this works, but it's kind of like the difference between like let's say I wanted to do Matplotlib versus like web development. Web development is a lot more work maybe, and I have to customize it a lot more. It's more flexible, but Matplotlib is just so much more convenient. And in the same way, sometimes using those tools can allow you to be a lot more productive um, that way. Awesome. I know you're involved in the data side, in the, in the development of the content, um, and, but I, I'm curious to know, being in this field, um, we had a few questions on people wondering if they just complete the nano degree, do you need a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD to actually get a job in the data field, or are there <laughs> opportunities for people who have taken the nano degrees to find um, a starting point? Right. So <laughs> I'll share this with you guys, but I don't have a bachelor's degree. Um, I dropped out for a variety of reasons, but I do think college is amazing. Um, it's definitely, it definitely can be difficult depending on the type of position you're looking for. If it's a very, very like research heavy position in a very like academic type situation, it is likely that they'll really like highly uh, prefer people with advanced degrees. But that being said, if you have a great portfolio and you can show through your experience and your work that you are competent, um, I, I mean, I've gotten <laughs> a data science job, so I definitely, uh, in, in general, the job search process can be discouraging because you'll see, um, like, you don't always hear back, but there, there's also like an amazing article, um, I think a coworker shared on a girl who got into Airbnb um, after being rejected so many times and she thought that like, it was such a dream job. But yeah, I think in the end, it's really just how much work you put in to study especially for like the interview um, and how much practice you get and just how, uh, how much, uh, I guess like what, just what your portfolio is made up of. If you have, again, like really great ways to visualize what you've accomplished and you have a great portfolio that shows you're very skilled in these topics, if you're competent, you'll get a job. Like it is like the tech field, which is a bit more generous with that. Um, so yeah. <laughs> That's awesome though. How did you get around that in your interviews when people were asking? And I think a big part of it is not apologizing that you don't have a degree and instead focusing on your skills. So how did you do that effectively to be confident and show that you were the right person for the job? Right. Um, so personally, uh, my learnings, I think I mentioned this in another webinar too, but uh, in terms of being the right person, if you took a Udacity course and you learned all of these skills in a very short time frame, it proves that you're a quick learner. It does prove you're self-motivated. Um, you can solve problems on your own and just like a, a lot of really great skills. So you should be very confident about that. Um, and 
I think just in the end, they just want to know what kind of person you are, how you learn, how you think, and what you know. And those are all things you can showcase through how you've learned what you know now and what you've accomplished so far. And I think the way you frame it um, does make a difference. I think, yeah, again, I, I just think saying you're a self learner and you learn much more effectively through like online courses and all these things. Um, it, it doesn't, you're not like a slacker. You did not get a degree because like you're lazy. Like you're obviously, you care about your education, which is why you're taking a Udacity course. Um, so yeah, be really confident, like own it. You're smart and awesome. you're very Just passionate. Change the conversation. <laughs> That's awesome. Just change Thank the you. conversation, right? To what, what, it, what you are at, good at. Oh, another quick note. Usually saying that I didn't have a degree was not the thing, first thing I mentioned. It usually came up because even it was like on last, I didn't say on the resume, like, I dropped out. I did go to school. It was there, but it's like one year. So it's like kind of obvious that I don't have a bachelor's degree, but um, I don't know. The whole resume is filled with projects and really cool stuff that I know and did. So they're going to talk about that. Like those are the first things they ask about. Um, there usually isn't a checkbox. I mean, actually maybe there is, um, but at least for the jobs that I applied to, or you can apply to too, there's many of them won't explicitly ask you like, Oh, before we interview, it's a hard requirement. They have a bachelor's degree. Do you have one? Like, I don't think that happens often. And like naturally after we've gotten really excited and they, we talked about all this data science stuff at the end, I might slip like, oh, by the way, I dropped out of college. And then like, oh yeah, we don't care. And that, that'll be cool. At that point, they're so distracted by all the amazing things you are doing that they don't care what you missed in the background, right? Right. <laughs> Good for you. Um, I, I have a question about um, the types of data. So getting more practical, um, when you're doing projects like in a classroom, in um, maybe working on other things, you get these data sets to work on. But in the real world, a lot of data uh, sets are dirty, right? It's not just clean data that's so simple to work with. Do you have any tips for people on bridging the gap between the learning and the pristine data sets that they get to the real world where most of the data will first need to be cleaned and how they should do that? Right. Um... So two ways, um, one way could be, um, well, actually the first way, data kind, <laughs> things like that. Well, you partner with other companies where it is really data and you just have to, add, no, it is really dirty and you have to dig in to all this stuff. But actually in general, um, if you come up with a project that you wanna add to your portfolio or just work on for fun, um, trying to collect that data yourself can be one option. I know for one of the projects I worked on, I had, I just had a bunch of survey data um, that I asked people to fill out and it was just like a natural language processing task. And there were a lot of problems that I figured out that I needed to clean. Um, there's also, oh, oh, okay. There's also like, you could scrape a bunch of data. Those are both like natural language processing, I guess. But um, I've also heard like you can do, part of the program I was uh, in before, you can partner with companies to do like small projects where you can dig into their data and do stuff for them. I think one big thing is, um, you don't always have to, when you're trying to find a data science problem, uh, you don't always have to look for like the, the super popular common ones and just look at a data set and then go from there. Just try to think about like, what's an interesting problem you want to solve um, and what's a field you're interested in. And then maybe even just contact organizations or contact um, or meetups or people who might be interested in solving this problem with you and have that data. Um, Cause I think there are a lot, other like many other ways to get sources of data than you may realize and then the work's more fun because you care about it right right so you, <laughs> talked about, you talked about using data for good um we're running out of time but i'd like to end with one question for you and that is can you name a project where you felt the most gratified that you made the most impact and use your skills to do something good for the world most impact so the project that i felt the most impact for um Okay, I'll be very honest here. Um, this is something I've been struggling for uh, quite a bit <laughs> because that's also, that's also another reason I went through this. Uh, so like personally, that's a problem that's very, very important to me, um, making sure that I use my skills and knowledge and just talent and everything in a way that can really benefit the most, um, biggest impact I can. And I think, uh, through, I think one big thing for me is just like in this phase right now, I'm developing a lot of skills and I also like obviously very, very enjoy um, working with Udacity um, to work on my skills and spread these skills to other people. I haven't worked on a project that was specifically for social good, 
that I am interested in doing it and I will be doing it, especially after uh, researching all of this. That's another reason I really wanted to do this presentation because I know this is something I've been caring about and I wanted to like dig into this more. Um, I think you're but, being hard on yourself, you know, teaching other people <laughs> to learn to become data scientists is a pretty <laughs> nice impact you're making on the world. So think yeah. about the um, growth that that's going to, you're training all these other people to work on these projects too, so. Right, I'm just saying that like, I think that doing, um, I'm definitely going to start doing these social good projects, but I do, I think ultimately I would like to do it full time. Um, whatever I do in my career, eventually I want it to be like full time, something that I really feel like has a very high impact. Um, and before I get there, I just think I can be so much more powerful and effective in making that difference. The better I am in data science and the more experienced I am doing all this stuff. And actually teaching helps me a lot too, because <laughs> I learn new things every time I teach things and I like interacting with students. Um, so That's yeah. Awesome. But well, we've learned a lot from you today. So thank you for sharing all of your insights. It's been wonderful. Um, now we're going to pivot over and let everyone learn from each other. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Karen Baker, our community manager, who will go through the um, details of how we'll work the Zoom breakout session. So thank you, Juno, and welcome, Karen. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Juno. It was really informative and really, really interesting to listen to. And you can hear the excitement and passion in your voice it comes out. And so now I'm excited to turn it over to breakout sessions. And breakout sessions are an opportunity to have you all get a chance to connect with each other directly. You've sat and you've listened to us and it's been a really engaging conversation, but you've been more kind of taking in the information. And now we want to turn the tables over to you so that you can connect with each other, with fellow students and alums all around the world and introduce yourself and share what you're excited about and share what questions you have around data science and data for good and how that can be applied. And so to help guide these conversations, we do have an alum host on the line who I would love to introduce herself. Her name is Rebecca. And Rebecca, if you could just say a few words, I'm going to unmute yourself now. All right. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Rebecca. I am a graduate of the Data Analyst Nanodegree Program and am currently completing the Data Science Nanodegree Program. Uh, what's interesting for me is that uh, no one checked with me about this before uh, we connected up with Juno's comments, but I come to data science from uh, homelessness. I worked for 15 years in the homelessness sector and so uh, my motivation for learning this stuff is about being able to better understand the world around us and how we engage in the decisions that we make to be able to do things like uh, help us end homelessness. So uh, that's actually where I come to the field from. That's awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. And then we'll also have Juno as a host of a session and then Jane as the host of a session. And a few rules of the road is that while you can post the chat, this is really meant to be a conversation. So feel free to unmute yourself, to turn your video on and to actually be brave, unmute and connect with other people out there in the world who also want to meet you and learn from your experience because you know so much that can help someone else. I would also say to focus on positive, actionable advice. So this is a celebration and really focus on what you've learned that could help someone else. If you're not speaking, be sure to mute your microphone. And when you do speak, be sure to remember to unmute so we can all hear you. And above all, introduce yourself, have fun, get to know each other and really share what you're excited about. And so what's going to happen is I'll break us into breakout rooms. You'll get a pop-up on your screen and you're going to have to click accept to join the breakout room. It'll say that you're being invited to join a breakout room. And then it may take up to a minute to go into those breakout rooms. But once you're there, people should be filtering in and feel free to start introducing yourself. And so we are going to go about now and we'll see you back in about 20 minutes. Awesome. How was that for everyone? I know it can be a bit uncomfortable at the start, but Rebecca, how was your session or discussion? We were a little quiet. We had a, had a couple of brave folks who were willing to jump in on the voice with me. And then we had some good questions in the uh, chat as well. But I realized because I got, I got moved between two it quickly, suddenly moved to another breakout session. So I forgot to press record. That's or, okay. <laughs> but it, yeah, we had some good questions. That's awesome. Um, any highlights from the conversation? It's so cool to see people's faces here. I think we're having everyone coming back now. Yeah, we should all be closed. Perfect. And you can see my screen. 
Awesome. Thank you, everyone. I hope you had as many meaningful connections as we did in our breakout session. Um, Juno had some um, Uber fans in our session, which was wonderful. They got to connect and she got a lot of love from everyone very deservedly. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. And thanks for being so generous with your time and with yourself and exposing yourself to asking questions and giving answers and to sharing, connecting with other people. Um, our next session starts in 15 minutes and we will be doing a drive-through tour of self-driving cars with David Silver. You can find the link to join at udacityfestival.com. If this is your last session of the day, Thanks again for being part of this amazing network. Uh, you can connect on LinkedIn. If you're an alum, visit the alumni portal at alumni.udacity.com and you can stay connected with us. On the alumni portal, we have um, opportunities to connect on Slack, LinkedIn, and Facebook, as well as upcoming events and stories about our alumni that are featured on there. Um, if you're a current student, you can stay connected on the student hub, which is in your classroom. The guided study area connects you to students that are in your cohort, so you can connect on specific project questions. And you can also go into the new community channel to connect with the greater um, across, nano, across cohorts with it, within your nano degree in general um, to ask questions of the broad, broader community. And also, we'll be starting to use that channel. To, we'll be alumni will be invited very shortly, and we'll be using that channel to do presentations such as Ask Me Anything sessions. I know um, Sebastian Thrun is going to do one very soon on that channel, and we'll also be doing experts in residence and maybe some career counseling as well on, on that channel as well. So looking forward to really great ways to stay connected with the network. If you are not a student yet, um, but are interested, join us on udacity.com to find out more about all of the ways you can get involved with either a data, data nano degree or a nano degree in some other way. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Stay curious and keep learning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>